second presenter is Kathy Maslow, um, and she's the co-founder and CEO of uh, Danny, uh, which is a nonprofit organization formed in 2005 by parents of young adults who are experiencing physical and or cognitive challenges. Kathy's going to talk about a number of ways that Danny is used to find resources uh, all along the way that, uh, that they need it. So, different accent. Um, okay, so first of all, DENI stands for Developing and Nurturing Independence, as well as the Hungarian way how you spell my son's name. It happens to be Daniel, so it's named after him. And a group of us started this organization in 2005-2006 um, to come up with um, a way how to continue um, their life after high school uh, in a meaningful way. They were always integrated through uh, their life in schools, and we wanted to make sure that they are continuing this in an integrated setting, and they would have some vocational training and become contributing member of the society. So that's how Danny started. Um, we also uh, wanted to make sure that we can sustain ourselves. So a while ago, actually, I was asked to do a very similar presentation. And I was asked to tell parents how to run and start and run an organization uh, without any money. So I had to refuse this presentation because, of course, it's impossible to run it without any money. Uh, but you can definitely run it uh, in a way that the funding comes from uh, some new source, not your traditional uh, funding. So. so the traditional funding sources are really mainly government funds. We're talking about many, many years back uh, when uh, the government gave um, a chunk of money to transfer payment agencies, and transfer payment agencies created government supported spots, and then they place people in day programs, and uh, so on and so on. So there are issues with that. First of all, uh, in my mind, and I wear many hats, right? So I'm as a I'm a parent of a 29 year old who have special needs, as well as I'm an administrator of an organization, right? So as a parent. Many of these organizations who are running the traditional day programs might not meet the requirement I really wanted to, to do for my own son. As well as, of course, we all know about the huge wait list for all kinds of programs uh, all around. Uh, so this, this is one traditional funding, and of course there is like different user prints and fundraising efforts to to help ourselves. So these are like the traditional funding sources. Now we came up with an idea it's called innovative funding. So what is an innovative funding? Uh, these are like relying on new ideas. So when we started Danny. And we, we had a very strong need to put in something which would provide uh, vocational training for our own children, for the young adults post high school. We also wanted to attach something to this non-for-profit, uh, which would be for-profit. So we would provide um, uh, money. We would provide uh, some uh, net income, which is turned back into the organizational budget to support additional uh, programs. It's very much what we just heard about about the coffee shed, which I'm very familiar with, uh, because that was one program we visited. Um, Common Grants was one of the programs we visited before we ever started Danny. And then we looked around for all around in Toronto and Ontario and all around the world. And actually, I find the right match all the way far away land in South Africa, in Cape Town, uh, which was very much the model I really thought was going to work for us. Uh, when they had different arms of a social enterprise or a business model attached to this non-for-profit, providing different kind of vocational training for different people. Because not everybody has the desire, the ability, the interest or the goal to work in 
in a catering project, uh, they might have other strengths and which we can help to train and develop and they can work in an other area of this social enterprise. So just to back a little bit about the business model, there are different things we can you, we can do. So a non-for-profit can sell, now I'm talking as an accountant, which I happen to be an accountant. So a non-for-profit can actually sell things. They're still non-for-profit. They can, they can sell and they can get money for it, which they're gonna use in their non-for-profit organization. The social enterprise is, is, is a, a bit different from, us, from that. And there is a very, very new thing coming up, which called the B corporation and it's a benefit corporation which really runs like a regular corporation we're gonna look at it in a minute um, but has a very strong social uh, uh, responsibility so let's look at the different business models so the non-for-profit selling is we see that all the time. They have occasional sales, like there is an art show or there is a local market, and then uh, things like, let's say, this, this, this organization, like the, the clients are producing art projects, they, they sold on the market. So these are occasional uh, times, and occasional profit is made, which is perfectly OK. But it, of course, with the word occasional, meaning it's not too much money coming in because it's occasional. A social enterprise is really a business model which is formed and operated like a business. It generates ongoing profit and it is therefore provides more funds for this non-for-profit side. The B corporation is like the benefit corporation, which is type of a for-profit corporate entity with a very positive impact on society and usually on the environment uh, with, with a defined goals. This is very new. It exists in 28 states in the United States, and now we have it in a few places in Ontario. I, this is something to keep your eye on because this is actually the future, uh, how larger amounts of funds can be generated. So I'm not 100 and 100% 100 sure how we would make this work for us, for our own Danny organization, but this is something I definitely am interested in the future. What I most know about is the social enterprise model because that's what Danny is. So in a tagline, I can tell you what it is, that we are out there to get a hand up instead of a hand out. So what does it mean? The traditional ways that ongoingly organizations are begging for money. It could be the government, could be donors, could be sponsors, but we ongoingly have to ask for money because, of course, the budget is high and it gets higher and higher and more money is needed. So it's, it's really, really not a good position to be. A hand up meaning is that we are asking for help, but we're not asking for money. We are asking for people to use our services. It's very much like the coffee shed. You want people to come and drink the coffee there instead of the corner store one corner away. Same coffee, probably better coffee. Very good service, I hope. Market price and the good guy feeling, right? That you actually had a cup of coffee and you made the world a better place. You, you had a coffee, you wanted a coffee, right? Like you get what you wanted, but you really made a difference in somebody's life. So this is a hand up. When you ask your community, the people around you to come and frequent your businesses and therefore to help you to generate income. Our philosophy on a small micro level, when we think about our clients, our participants, are very similar that when I'm thinking about the organization. On a personal level, for somebody who has, anybody by the way, doesn't have to have challenges, anybody. If you have an opportunity when you actually can work and they train you and they teach you and they give you the opportunity and you can go out in the morning and come home in the afternoon that you did something and at the end you get a paycheck, is much more rewarding than somebody at the end of the week going to give out a check to say, okay, you know what, you should also have, right? Like, I feel bad for you. 
you should have. Uh, so therefore, on a personal level, it's important for our participants that they do learn and they get the training and they get the chance and they work as much as they can and they develop their skills and they do get a paycheck which they earned. This is a hand up on a personal level. And as an organization, uh, when we generate income from a business and we know that we did something for it and we were not begging, but we provided a service and we got paid for it, it's a much better feeling uh, than getting a government check. Not to say we don't want the government check, but we want both. So the social enterprise is really a business venture with a social twist, meaning it works like a business, profit is generated, Vocational training possibilities are out there for the participants. We prepare them for the job market. And then the profit is turned back into the organizational budget to support additional programs, either into the vocational training to pay a job coach, or we have additional programs like recreational and educational programs, which of course is very expensive. So this profit is used for that. So that's what the business with the social twist means. It builds on the community, on a community support. It's open to the public, right? So anybody can come in and anybody can take part of the, the you know, take, take part of this business. It's very important to find a niche market, right? Because we are operating as a business. So you don't want to be the uh, 56th whatever on the street to sell the same thing because then it's much harder to make sure that the public actually comes to you. So you have to find a place, with, find a business which is really needed in the area where you are. And of course, because it's community based, I cannot tell you what is needed in your area. I can tell you what was needed in our area. So we're gonna get there. It works like a business. It has to be professionally run and managed. Meaning you do not want anybody to feel sorry for you and come into your store because they feel sorry for you, right? You know why? Because they only come once. Once they feel sorry for you, they get the good guy feeling, they never return for the next cup of coffee. On the other hand, if it managed professionally, it runs like a business, it has a market value product and a market value price, then they will come back because they want another good cup of coffee. Why are they getting the good guy feeling? Okay, it's very important. You do never ever want anybody to feel sorry for you, neither as an organization nor as an individual. So that, that's, that's something, keep it in forefront. So profit is generated, just like any other business, there is a profit margin, meaning you have to be smart about it. Like you don't want to undersell yourself because, oh, we are just like, you know, we're working with these people and you want to make sure that customers are coming. If you have a good product, you make a market research, you see how your competitors are selling and you stay on that market value and you generate profit. You are out there to make money, right? There is a difference, right? There are no shareholders in this business. The non-for-profit part is really the shareholder. We work a little bit different than common grants in terms of like our participants are not like partners. They are employed by the social enterprise and they paid by the social enterprise from the profit. And then the net profit is turned back into the non-for-profits organizational budget. Of course, there is, and the, the business is not just out there to generate money and help us financially, but also to, sh uh, to provide vocational training possibilities. We never want it to be a business for the sake of being in a business only. We want it to make sure we put in social enterprise arms, which is serving the clients who we have right now in the areas they are interested in and the goals they would like to reach. So they are trained in the business. And when I say business, it's they really trained in the business. So let's say, we do have a catering arm, uh, Danny Berry Delights. And some of the clients are working in the kitchen, in food prep and all kinds of like traditional kitchen like work. On the other hand, we have participants who have no desire to work in the kitchen, including my own son. Uh, on the other hand, they're very business savers heavy, so they like to go and collect the money, uh, take, send out the invoice to the customers, 
make sure the banking is okay. And so they work on the other part of the business. They really part of the business. So don't just think about them as dishwashers because oh, you also want to make sure these people can advance. They're not forever supposed to work for minimal wage. Yes, some of them start out as minimal wage, but who says that they forever have to work like that, right? Like they can advance and we want them to advance. They take pride in their work. And it's very important, right? They come in in the morning, they leave in the afternoon knowing that they did something great. When we are open to the public and we have, we have a, one of the other arm is a coffee house and people come in and they order and they tell these people that, wow, service was great today. It means so much to these people, more than the tip, which they also appreciate. But it's so much that they, and they voice it, like they say that this is the first time people look up at me instead of down at me. You know what it means, this statement, like, never mind the money, right? Just for that, it's, it's already worthwhile. Once they train and once they're working, they are paid. And as coming shank market, market value. Uh, we absolutely don't believe in uh, giving them money because they don't know anyway. Give them $5 an hour, what do they know? They have no budgeting skills like these people, like they don't understand money. Not true, number one. Number two, even if it's true, it's not fair. If they did the amount of work like anybody else, they should be paid like anybody else. And especially very important, once they start to work in the open market, we have to show the example to the open market that we treat our own people fairly. Nobody ever should get less money than the minimum wage. If they don't work the minimum wage, they should be volunteering and they should not work for money. They're still in training. Therefore, they could be considered as trainees or volunteers. That's fair enough. But if they get paid, they should be paid properly. So that's our philosophy. And that's what we transpire to our partners in the open market. We prepare them for the open job market. Will everybody work in the open job market? No. Because the social enterprise is somewhat sheltered, some of the people who we have as clients need this sheltered employment. And most likely, we don't know, I never say never because it wouldn't be fair, but most likely for very long they would need this sheltered environment. Once they're ready for an open market place to work there, we have to train and ongoingly support the employers. That's very important because it's not so difficult to get a job once they trained. What is very difficult to keep the job because the first thing something happens and the manager was like a bit rough and maybe raising his voice. These people are very fragile. So they're gonna say, I never come back here. They're yelling at me. Right? So it's very important to work with the employer, to, to desensitize them, to make them understand who are these people and the value of these people and how to work with them. The participants also need ongoing support. We call that there's a buffer zone between the employers and the employees. It's usually like a social worker's position to make sure that things go smoothly. The employer can come to back to us and say, listen, there is a bit of an issue with whatever, or the participant come back and say, I, I don't understand. And they, they're giving me something new to do and they never told me how. So we can be there and we can go back and we send the job coach back and we retrain people or, or move them if we need to from one position to the next. But the aim is that they will actually keep their jobs. It's very important. So let's see about the Danny social enterprise arms. <laughs> So our most profitable arm is the Danny Dairy Delights Catering Arm. When we make all kinds of you know, orders, we fill the orders, and you know, uh, marketing is not our strength, by the way. May I should learn from you. <laughs> we try to market ourselves. Uh, it's not so easy. Danny also a very unique organization in a way that we work with very, very few paid employees and a huge range of volunteers. Therefore, our office, we do not have any paid office staff. Everybody's a volunteer. So from this, we don't have any marketing specialists or social media specialists or any of those people. Everybody's a volunteer and they are great, but again, like, you know, they come when they can and we try to count on them as much as we can, but they are volunteers. Um, so therefore we are lacking in certain areas and we're working on it 
a lot. Um, the catering arm is the most profitable one. When we moved into a new location two years, uh, two years ago in York region, we are at Clark and Butters, and it's a much, much bigger location. We actually were able to put in a small event center. So we can host events for not so small, up to about 200 people. And so we have birthday parties and anniversary parties and anything, the dog's birthday, nothing is, like, doesn't matter. And, um, it's quite busy. Some of the young adults are trained to work to put together an event. They can follow a diagram, how to put the tables together. They go and rent the tablecloth. So they are part of this whole event center thing. Then we also have the coffee house, which is open to the public. And we are open only for lunch so far. Not, sometimes we have like this like pilot project to open for dinners, but mainly we are open for lunch. And uh, the community comes and they frequent our places. We try to promote ourselves with like coupons, like you want to make sure the people are coming in. So free coffee, free internet, like we're trying our best. Uh, we also have a gift store. The gift store mainly sells um, hostess gifts. We bake cookies in our kitchen. The young adults with the volunteers, they bake the cookies. And then we have another group of people to package them beautifully. I absolutely agree. Packaging is very important. It should look like, wow, because of course you can get better price if it's like um, really great. We have many supporters also from the community help us with gift in kind donations. So we get like the glass platters from one place donated to us and the wrapping material from another place. Like we go around and, and um, we ask people to come and help us with another hand up, right? They get something out of it. They get a good, nice don gift in kind donation receipt and we get free wrapping stuff so we try to be very very resourceful and lower our expenses so the profit margin is much higher we also manage the snack bar inside the Garnet Williams Community Center strictly working with volunteers and and our uh, participants therefore again the profit margin is much higher because wages are not involved and um, uh, there is a senior club, so we get lots of seniors to help us out. And we try to get, uh, the, the volunteers are great people because again, the biggest expense in an organization is our wages. And after wages, the rent. But wages really, uh, in a case like ours, is 75% of the budget is really wages. So if anywhere you can replace a wage with a volunteer, of course, it's a great thing to do. We also have a greenhouse, which is an accessible greenhouse. With the help of the Trillium Fund, we put it in. It produces herbs and, uh, and vegetables for our catering kitchen. And the access is sold on an occasional farmer's market. Again, gives an other training opportunity to to other people who are very interested in, in the, the farming industry and then they can work in the greenhouse. And then one future arm is coming up, the Danny Wash and Fold. We already started on it, it's like a laundry service. So far we only service our catering business with all the tablecloth washing and all the kitchen stuff, but eventually it could be a business to service other um, neighboring like hairdressers and restaurants. Uh, this is our last uh, slide to, to show you. This is a current, how the current Danny funding works. So about 30% are tuition fees or user fees. Um, parents pay for the services, but of course we all know, again, wearing my parent hat, that we all have very limited funding, so therefore parents never can pay for the actual cost of running the program. So about 30% is covered by the tuition fee. Uh, we do not get any government support, but we do write lots of grants, and sometimes and somewhat we are successful, but we are only reaching about 5% of our budget. Hopefully it will grow if you know we get more recognized. 15% um, of our budget is really covered by the net revenues of the social enterprise. And it looks a little number 15%, but if you think about it, as a business, we are only two years old. If you have your own for-profit business and you can show 15% profit in two years, you are doing really well. 
I used to work in the for-profit end. So believe me, if your first year you are, everybody's in the red, and if you can pull yourself out of the red second year, you are a very successful business person. So I'm very proud of this 15%, and 50% is still covered by different fundraising uh, force, and um, I definitely gonna look into the crowdfunding because I think that's the future. Uh, but we have a traditional gala and different sponsors coming on, and and uh, uh, we still have this traditional fundraising end. I certainly hope that the green is going to grow and the purple is going to shrink. And I definitely hope that the brownish color gonna grow because the, hopefully the, the government recognizes our efforts and uh, see that this is the future. I really think this is the future for any organization. It doesn't matter if it's people you know, with disabilities or any, anything else. I think every organization has to realize that we cannot rely on the government as much as we can say we should. It's really impossible or forever we have to wait. I personally am not prepared to wait, right? Because my son is getting older and I want him to be successful and in a good place. I cannot sit back and say, it's my right as a taxpayer that the government gonna do that. Da, da, da. Maybe it's true, but by the time this all gets, the message gets through, my son, and I gonna be six feet under and he gonna be 120. I really don't want to wait for that, right? I wanna make sure to see him succeed. I see these other guys succeed and the organization to succeed. And I really believe this is the way to go and it's doable, right? It's doable because it's, we are not the first one, others exist. You just have to think really outside of the box and, 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 and it's possible. So that's who we are. And uh, I, I invite everybody to come and have lunch by us. And uh, see how great the kids are. Thank you.